Welcome to all of you, to the, the, the hundreds of people I, I can't quite see before you, before me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Green, and this is uh, a little event. Well, it's, it's hinging around Mianjin's 80th birthday. I'm the editor of Mianjin, and Mianjin, that publication which began in Brisbane in December 1940. So we're just publishing our 80th anniversary edition, and this event's been billed as a a birthday party, so I'm, I'm hoping that there may at some point be cake and, and lolly bags and we'll have games <laughs> or, or not. I'm, and I'm sorry if that disappoints. Um, it won't just be me. Um, we're joined uh, in conversation uh, this afternoon. Well, it's, and it's not just this afternoon. We've got various time zones at play here. Uh, Beiruz Bachani joins us, and Beiruz from New Zealand, he is a, a Kurdish-Iranian exile, he's a journalist, he's a writer, was a prisoner of the Australian government between 2013 and 19, a resident now of New Zealand, and, and winner of the Victorian Premier's Prize for non-fiction in 2019 for No Friend But The Mountains, writing from Manus Prison. And our other participant is Tara June Winch. And what a day for Tara. Uh, Tara is a Wiradjuri author. She's based in France and is now living in, in the last months of the officially proclaimed Year of the Yield. Um, her novel today won the Prime Minister's Award for Literature. It's already taken out the Miles Franklin Award this year, the Christina Stead Prize for Fiction, the People's Choice Award, and Book of the Year at the 2020 New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards, a, a stupendous success. Uh, we are going to chat, but before we do, we need to recognise that all of us uh, around watching this and participating in Australia are, are standing, sitting, existing uh, on, on, on land, on country that was until the European settlement uh, under the custodianship of Australian Indigenous First Peoples for 40, 50, 60, who knows how many thousands of years. That custodianship unbroken in that time, but, but broken by settlement um, and land never ceded to the peoples arriving in this place. And we should pay respect to that land and to the people who were custodians of it for so long. For me in Melbourne, that's the Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nations. For all of you around the country, it will be different peoples, um, but the relationship is the same, one of, of long-term care and long-term belonging of people and land and land and people. Um, we're gonna chat for about 45 minutes and then there will be a chance for all of you to uh, participate and ask questions. You may well interject in the process of it. The uh, People behind the scenes here will be uh, will be looking for your your thoughts. So please, you know, pop them in on the chat. Participate. This is a, a chance for us all to have a conversation. And a conversation here is the beginning. In, in, in the December issue of Mianjin, there is a conversation published between uh, Tara and Beirut, and it's a, a beautiful meditation on a range of things. And we'll. we'll pick some of those issues out and, and dig into them a little in, in these next minutes. But I wanted to ask, first of all, you two, your, your regular correspondence, you're in touch with each other a lot. Um, how did you meet? Tara, you can begin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, baby, baby. Um, we met uh, last year, Beirut, last July. Yeah. I think in uh, Indonesia at the Ubud Readers and Writers Festival, I interviewed Beirut and also Omid, um, Beirut's translator. Uh, yeah, so we met over the screen as many people have met Beirut <laughs> over the screen over the years. And, um, <clears throat> and then we started corresponding just during this year. And you, you've kept that up. Have you not better is almost daily now? Pardon? That correspondence, that, that communication between you and Tara, it's very... Yeah, very yeah but uh, I, th I think uh, Tara now... I, I forgot to say hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would like to really congratulations to Tara for the award. I think it's very important uh, achievement. I... Uh, 
last year we met each other in Uber uh, festival. On that time, I remember I had lots of events and my internet was not good. And uh, that's why I really didn't know. It, it is difficult to remember everyone. And later, after a year, Tara sent me a message on WhatsApp. And I thought that because I received lots of messages and uh, I didn't really answer. Then after a while, she sent another true. message. She said, it's true. <laughs> she said, I'm coming to uh, New Zealand for the festival. And then I thought, oh, this is Tara. Then so we talk about the festival. And later I found out that Tara was exactly that person that I met in that festival. So, I mean, it was like this, you know? But now uh, Tara is busy with writing, but sometimes we communicate with, uh, mostly with uh, writing letters. And I think it's very good for me because I am uh, trying to move from uh, Farsi language to English language and uh, from Kurdish language to English language. So that's why it's very good. It's privileged to be in touch with Tara and write sometimes. I want to talk a lot about language as we go on because it's such an important thing to, to yeah. both of you. Before we do that, the, the exchange you have in Mianjin begins with some thoughts around time and they yeah. too are incredibly interesting. What, Tara, do you think has, has happened to time in these, this year just past? How, how has the shape of time changed? I think it's as if... Um everything that was put off in a way kind of condensed into this year. Um, yeah, and as I said, like entering this letter with Beirut, and I think Beirut, you were kind of avoiding the question. Do you remember you kept saying this is the most difficult yeah. question ever, stop asking me it. <laughs> um, but I just couldn't understand how, where the year had went. I didn't understand um, how fear, was playing a role in how I perceive time. Um, fear, fear around the pandemic, fear around to get being away from home. Um, and the fear I think in Europe was really real at the beginning. Um, yeah, I was confused in time. I think I just wanted to, it, and it was about just reaching that point where you have, you're sharing a confusion. This is a, um, synchronicity in the confusion in, in what's happening in the world. Does that make sense? It does. And it's it's an amazing thing to, I mean, as you, as you say there, the, the idea of the synchronicity and, the, and those sort of shared concerns and that 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 idea that, and this is another thing that we'll, we'll come to, of, of sort of that, that shared global experience suddenly, that we were very much people joined in a, in a similar set of responses. Beirut, does that- oh, Should I answer? Actually, uh, I think time is, uh, the, I, I have been, uh, you know, engaged with this concept for many years and now still is a big challenge for me because I talk through my experience, so I'm not talking uh, theoretical. I talk just through my experience as a person who uh, had an uh, unbelievable experience over the past seven years. And uh, when I left Iran, uh, so that is incredible. Uh, for a while, I was thinking about this. When I left Iran, I was sure that I was 28 years old. And when I came to Australia, they sent me to uh, Manus Island. And I don't know why I lost 
two years, you know. I was in Manus Island for six years. And when I was, I left Iran, I was 28 years. So I should be 34 years <laughs> old. But I found that I'm 36 years old. And really, I was thinking about this, where I lost these two years, you know? And that's why I, I was thinking about this. I feel um, that when you move from a place to another place, I mean, from other part of the world to other part of the world, this part, you, your understanding of time really changed and you don't understand time. And I think that is relation between uh, time and place. So that, that is my experience. And sometimes I think about time in a different way. When I was in uh, that prison, so when you are a detainee, you should imagine future. Because if you don't imagine future, it's difficult to endure that hardship, that prison. And uh, so you live in prison. And when you get freedom, is uh, difficult to get back to a normal life. Still, you think that about future. And uh, when you are in a prison, people think that in the prison, uh, time goes very slow, but mm -hmm. actually times, time goes very fast. And when you get freedom, you find that, oh, six years was like this you know was like this and that's why now i feel that i live in future you know that is my understanding my imagination of time and but i'm sure uh now is better but i think it's take time that i get back to a normal life and understand time uh, like other people. I don't know that that makes sense or not. It does. Uh, Tara, that, that was one of the amazing things I thought that, that Beirut wrote in your exchange, that idea of time in captivity being quick rather than slow. Did that, Tara, did that, did that surprise you? Was that, how, what did you feel when you, when, when you read that from Beirut? Tara, are you muted? No, you're just quiet. Yeah, I'm muted, sorry. Because <laughs> um, an alarm went off to take my child to the school bus. Um, it was Beirut's experience. And I, as I said, I could never understand that, but I could feel, and I think we've connected on this before, Beirut's about um, how when I first come to France and I was sort of made mute in that language mm. and living as, not as a refugee, but illegal. So scared to go to police, um, having to find illegal housing, having to illegally enroll my child in school. Um, and I think when you're in that um, sort of desperate mode of living and for years we were like that for four years but it, I can't remember it. it felt like that time didn't exist you know it, and it built onto that time it took to write the novel but it was nothing it was just um an act it was a <clears throat> period of survival and it and it just disappeared Think. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm seeing, I'm still confused. Desperation when you're not in yeah. control of everything around you, that does time disappear from you, disappear from your control and your, and you have, when you have no agency. That I was interesting. Too, that idea of it being, you know, in, in a difficult circumstance of time somehow speeding up. I wonder if that is a trick of, of reflection. I wonder if in, in the moment 
that time expands and becomes you know a difficult and long experience but in reflection it becomes compressed that that difficult time just becomes moments yeah i don't know it's amazing i want to explore it more and in in the future and writing it's i think it's good to be at sort of the center of our confusion and and our question um, questioning as writers and I think that's the importance of having sort of a writing companion like Beirut's and having that exchange like what do you think about this concept and sort of trusting each other to be wrong you know Beirut's trusting each other to explore an idea or um, a memory I think is really yeah I know necessary. I think yeah I'm uh tired of thinking about this concept i mean time yeah i already sent a letter to Clara. i explained that i said so she asked me a question and i wrote a long letter and at the end of the letter i say that don't me ask this don't ask me this question again but i wrote it in a poetic way i say that in a poetic way yeah i don't remember exactly what i wrote but, uh, you know, but uh, I'm very interested at, uh, you know, Tara's uh, work and how she think about uh, memory and uh, how, and I think her book, The Yale and other her book, and I think that is important because she take, she live in this memory you know, and this memory is like a, a not her a personal memory, you know, it's related to the history of, uh, you know, trauma and colonialism in Australia. And she take that, you know, and bring it to the literature, she rewrite it. And uh, I think that is very interesting for me. Uh, and we already uh, discussed this a lot. And for me, as a person who, you know, be because people think about the refugees without background, you know, people think that I am only uh, exist through my experience in Manus Island and in New Zealand. But before that, I was 20 years old, you know. And um, 30 years, sorry, I think probably, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, this memory is coming with me. I have it, you know, I have it. And sometimes it's shocking because when you write, when you write about your, the place that you born, the people that you left, uh, when you write about that, sometimes the, through your writing, uh, I mean, the words that you create, you write, take you to uh, places that you already forgot them, you know, forgot those memories. But through writing, you suddenly you face uh, that uh, those memories that you already forgot. And that is, uh, you have a nostalgia feeling and understanding. Sometimes it's amazing feeling and sometimes it's scary, you know? Sometimes it's scary when you, for example, when you just remember something from your mother that you didn't see her for seven years you know it's sometimes it's scary and that's why i started to write a novel but and tara say that you should continue to write it and say i cannot do this because because it's too when raw. You, yes it's big you know, so now I'm writing short stories. When I write a short story, 
uh, when I finish it, then I do nothing, you know, for two weeks a week, you know, just go to the city, play soccer, you know, become a very normal person again. <laughs> because, yeah, because when you just, I finish this and I think I talk a lot. When you become a refugee, you are like a tree that someone take you and want to plant you in a different place. So you are not really settled. It's take time mm. that you feel settled. You have roots, you know, grew up your roots in the ground. So that's why I'm not really, not ready to have a, this journey through writing a novel. It's big, it's huge you know, for me. You know what I said? I said sometimes when you're focusing on writing short stories, you may just accidentally be writing a novel. So just, I think, give it time, Beirut, and. Um, and I think by saying to yourself and by allowing yourself to have those smaller goals saying, okay, this is just a short story. There's not that pressure of an enormous novel, you know, just the way that when you were writing those WhatsApp messages, they were in short paragraphs, short chapters. It wasn't an entire heavy tome, you know, um, and this, you know, great um, epic, this burden to carry. So I think yeah, by going in step by step. So it's interesting about letters and, and and coming back to memory, coming and drawing back to memory because it um, allows us to enter sort of this universal truth through, through nature, um, through that skin to skin touch, through the memory of animals, um, mountains, rivers. And I think by doing that, it was also this process of finding the finding that mirror image in New Zealand, finding sort of a um, a a sort of almost a brother in that way. Tara, for you that that thing of the, the Beirut is that you know the, the, the anxiety of being lost in the novel uh, for you for you ten, 10 years writing the yield how 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 does it 10 years living in a project or living in work like that how do you find your way through that I mean like I said it doesn't feel like that it felt it feels like it was just something that I explored for a period of time. But I mean, side by side, I lived, like life has to inform your art. I made sure I lived and um, was there for my child and, um, and I had to, you know, earn money to pay rent in various ways over 10 years. You know, I couldn't just be a writer. Financially, I couldn't just be a writer. Um, so I think, the commitment to come back to the page is because people give up on you. People stop asking you if you're working on things over a period of 10 years when you take too long. So I think there has to be whatever we're writing, whether what, it, what Beirut is working on or what I'm working on now, it has to move us. It has to be such a, um, a thing we must do, like only for ourselves. It's a truth telling that must come out because otherwise we'll give up on a project. As many writers have, you know, um, you know, discarded manuscripts or on that process, on that road to really writing their truth, that thing that rocks them, you know, that gets under their skin. Yeah, I think it's just that holding on. It must. I mean, it, it, it's a burden, I guess, in some ways, but also a gift to have that truth to write. I mean, there are so many writers who are skipping stones across the water. They are they are involved in sort of ephemeral projects. It's very rare to have um, 
that sort of calling to the art of, of writing. That's a gift, I think. I know. I think it's, I think it was the same with No Friend But The Mountains in a way, um, Beirut. I wonder if you're feeling that energy towards this new work and this sort of new identity as a, as a fiction writer, Beirut. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm sure that for everyone is like this, but for me is very, uh, you know, identity and getting my identity back or keeping my identity uh, is very important. It's very, it's big challenge in whole my life because I grew up, I was born in Iran as a core and uh, they, you know, the system there, he, they colonized uh, our land, our culture. And when I was seven years old, I had to uh, learn Farsi, you know, they deprived us. They just, the system try, still continues like that to assimilate us. So I grew up in that, you know, in that situation. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, identity is very, is, key, is a key concept uh, in all my life and actually became a, my identity in some ways. And now I'm really, I want to write uh, something uh, different. Can you see me? Yes, you're there. Yeah. So uh, now I don't want that people look at me. So in Manu Island, I was writing uh, to get my identity back because they reduce us to a number. They, when you become a refugee, you lose your identity. It doesn't matter who is, who are you and what is your background. And all of my works in Manus Island, the movie, the book, or articles, anything that I created was uh, working to ch challenge the system, you know, to uh, say that we are, exist, and we are human. You know, that is my work in Manus Island, and now, I want to do something else. I want to write a, a fiction book, short stories or novel about something else, not, not about my experience in Manus Island, not about the refugees, because I don't want people still look at me through my experience in Manus Island. That is only a part of my life. So and that, the will life take, that will take time, won't it? That will take time for you to yeah. feel into this new world. Yeah. That idea, Tara, of, of, uh, of finding yourself and saying, I am here as a writer and, and perhaps as, as peoples as well. I mean, that, that's, that, that's a challenge in a book, that's a, but, and yet an important thing to say is, is that I mean is that part of your project as well to say not just personally but also as a statement of, of First Nations culture that, that I am here can you hear me Tara? yeah I can can you hear that noise or is it just me <laughs> that's my last alarm I wonder if I just tried to turn it off I heard what you said baby is it um, but can I just jump out and jump back in? Yes, of course, of course. Okay, because I can't, do, I can't do anything. Really sorry, I'm coming back. That's okay. I mean, that, that's a, I think that's a really interesting point you make, Beirut, about wanting to sort of put that, obviously, to put that part of your life and, and not let that, that, that moment in your life shape the future of what you do. Yeah, I know, but I uh, have a very... A wrong habit now, which is I feel I should do always fundamental work to 
you know, I think my body, my soul used to that. So I cannot just write a book. Mm. You know, I cannot just, uh, you know, I will, I think I used to challenge the uh, system or any system uh, fundamentally, you know, and that's why now I am actually writing in one of the Kurdish uh, dialects that is disappearing, you know? So I am writing a book that I should put a dictionary in end of the book for the readers, you know? But that's you know, a great then, thing for, for a writer to be able to do to to keep a language alive like that, and that's, that's yeah, yeah. So that is a fundamental work, you know. And uh, in the Iran context and in Kurdistan context, this work is very hugely challenging. It's challenging because no one already wrote a novel, or you know. We have poetry books, you know, our poetry, poetry is getting strong over the past uh, decade. But now I want to write that, you know, because in Iran, because of the colonialist system, people imagine that the only language which is strong and powerful is Farsi and other languages are just, they are accent, you know, because they, 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 their theory is that, because they want to deprive us to educate uh, with our language, you know, that's why I think it is like a revolutionary work, you know, but yes. I'm not sure that I'd be able to really create a strong work or not you know that readers should judge that or talk about it but i myself i am working on this now i mean it's such an it's such a powerful thing of of colonial force is to deprive people of languages to impose language and, and yeah. because of how much of culture is carried in language yeah if you go to twitter and see my last tweets you see how many people attack me on Twitter? Why? Because I say that, uh, so you spend this budget to Farsi language. What is, what about other languages? Just that. Mm -hmm. And really thousand people attack me on Twitter, thousands because they, they don't want to, you know, they targeted me, they targeted me, majority of the society, you know? Tara, Tara would say you should, you, should, you should turn it off and go back to the writing cave. You should... Uh... Oh, Jonathan, oh my goodness, our fights have been about him on Twitter, Beirut. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the distraction um, of the world, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Hard. Yeah. Uh, Politics always chase me. You know, I'm not a political person. Just I want to just enjoy writing, reading, enjoy the nature, but this politic is chasing me, you know, you cannot ignore it, in, in, especially in a country like Iran, that every day something big happens. You cannot really uh, ignore that, you know? Yeah. People expect from you, people... I, I was telling to Tara, she was doing uh, something on Instagram, to some kind of uh, activism. I say, don't do that, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, you, you don't have to do that, you know? Do you? You can, 
yeah, write uh, something. You know, always I say that, you know, in Manus Island, I was telling this many times that writing a love poem in that circumstances is a very political act. Okay. Because through that, you actually challenge the system, the perspective towards the refugees. You show that you are a human, you are not a terrorist or dangerous person, you know, that is because the government act. said that, you know? So that's why I think, uh, you know, the power of literature, the power of literature, I experienced that, you know? I experienced that. It's hugely important. You know, if you look at the Tara work, you know, if we look at it in terms of politics, what she did through the book Yale is hugely important. And it's a political act. It's, it's a resistance, you know, it's a part of, we should understand it through literature resistance because she, you know, take that part of history, you know, the, which is not the official history. She take it and, you know, bring it to literature and challenge the perspective, educate people, you know, about the indigenous people. Is all Tara, I mean, in, in literature, is it inescapably political? Is, is, is it a thing that, that good writing needs to do? I think that um, both Beirut's and my work as Indigenous people, our lives are politicised, and so we carry that burden. We carry that burden in our public lives. Like, Beirut's telling me not to be an activist. And me... telling him to get off Twitter. It's the same thing because he's being an activist on Twitter. The issues that come to our we tell the world about this, please mention this in your speech if it happens, you, you know? So, and I think that responsibility is, uh, we shouldn't run away from it, but I think we need to, to leave something for ourselves. And I think by putting it, those um, emotions and, and that, that history that we carry from our parents and our grandparents and our countries and, and by putting that in our art, by, by having that outlet of, of writing, we can sort of um, control the narrative and control who we are as artists because I'm not just going to be writing about um, language and the, this sort of the bloody stain of genocide on Australia of stolen land of, of of missionaries of the masters and slaves act I I can't do that because I'll fall apart just as Babe Ruth can't just write about refugees or write about I mean write about stuff that completely rips your heart out that's why it's so beautiful what you said Babe Ruth. the idea that you could write a love poem is such a um act of resistance the most political thing you can do is to be human and is to come home to yourself and to to have the freedom to write a political thriller write a comedy write a piece of theater um to explore your creativity because at the end of the day we're just writers we're creative people yeah i think I mean, it's interesting that, you know, you, you phrase that as, as burden and, and I guess in time too, that, you know, people's expectation um, of Indigenous writers in particular, you know, that expectation of, of, of carrying that burden of, of expressing in, in a voice for, for other people of, of, of that similar voice. There's, there is so much expectation bound up in this. Tara, are you, you're still there. Oh, I just lost you. <laughs> what you were speaking. You oh, the expectation. I just it came back in the audio. 
I think it's an honor. There's, there's, there's a double-edged sword. There's honor to that, but the, you must care for yourself, especially this year for Indigenous um, artists and public figures and musicians and just the requests and the constant um, sort of demanding of um, your thoughts um, and your, you know, heart and sinew, just everything. So I think it's it's about protection um, and, you know, honouring the ancestors you carry on your back and honouring those that have paved, you know, um, a way for us to even have a literature, you know, starting with Uchuru Nunuku in 1964. So, I mean, I think it's just about um, self-preservation in, in the act of being, being a writer. Someone just commented about comments in the comments. Um, I just wanted to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't, don't forget to put questions into the chat and we'll ask yeah. them. And I, I, well, there's one here from Jen Thompson and Beirut, I wonder if you feel this, you know, before your captivity, before your book, you, we didn't know your name. Is, is, is that celebrity, is that fame in its own way, a, a, another form of prison? Actually, I don't think that I, I, I'm famous. I don't feel that. Uh, but I think that is very big question and challenging question and important, you know, because when I arrived in New Zealand, actually, I for a month, for two months, I was a celebrity, actually. You know, because the news, uh, you know, the news about me three times became a very global news, you know. So, uh, and that created a huge attention. Uh, but I think that celebrity culture it was another, I don't say prison. It was a, a big challenge for me, you know, a big challenge because uh, you should struggle to don't lose your uh, identity as a person because when, when you get so much attention like that and suddenly everyone know you or many people know you or many people expect from you that uh, create a... can you hear me yes <laughs> ah, yeah yeah so that create a, a, like a delusion mm. around you and also uh, we are living in a capitalist system so on that time it's difficult to manage this because lots of media, lots of commercial media, lots of uh, people approach you and you should be brave enough to say no, you know? Mm. You should be brave to say no, I don't want to be a part of this event. I don't want to be a part of that, you know? Because if you do that, you get attention, you get money, you get, you know, but you lose your identity, you lose your journey, you lose your principles. So generally I say that it's very difficult to keep your principles alive, you know? So that, that is the thing, but now I'm not, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't feel that I'm famous or people know me especially in New Zealand that, and that people are very humble mm -hmm. and really people don't care who you are, what are you doing, you know, in this culture. I know there is this culture in New Australia too. Yeah, but some countries are with, with the celebrity culture, you know, like Iran is a hugely, it's exactly like America, you know, that you should be successful, you should achieve this, you should, you know, but 
uh, in just I want to have a really you know what I want just I want I don't want to lose my freedom you know to be crazy Tara um th this year I mean it, there's been a lot of you know big things or perhaps the, the almost the biggest thing this year would be the Black Lives Matter movement and how that just resonated internationally is there <laughs> I mean, people, you know, with COVID, people talk about sort of, you know, returning to normality. Is, is there a, a, a walking away from Black Lives Matter? Do, can that be unwound or is that reset something in, in global culture? I mean, it's the public's choice. It's, it's the media's choice whether to walk away or not. Um, I, I don't think so. I don't, I think it's a turning point. I think there was a line in the sand and I think it's, I mean, I can talk about our industry, for example, in literature. It's changing. It's going to change. We're going to have more than just um, two Indigenous authors on the Miles Franklin shortlist, and that's going to be okay. Um, you know, we're going to be in airports on the front. We're going to be in the big publishers' catalogues because I think by this act of truth-telling, this spotlight on Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter, in Australia made people realize, made the publishing in, in, in industry realize oh, they, they've really got something to say and Australia is actually mature and ready enough to listen, unlike Iran and, and the case of the Kurdish language there or other languages there. So um, I think it's about all industries and all players with power, not just resting on the individual and resting particularly on Indigenous people to, to keep taking it to the streets. But those with power really um, sort of setting the tone for the future and realising that line in the sand is there and in, in embracing it. You know, we're the oldest continual living culture on, on, on earth where the original storytellers, these are incredible stories that are out there. And our languages are so central to our culture our land that everyone lives on, um, we can be, we can actually find ourselves as real Australians and be in touch with ourselves through language, through the language that exists on that land, through homelands. Oh, I just, it's frustrating. Um, yeah, I think, but I think, you know, publishers have a responsibility, like yourself, Jonathan, you know, like any, any of the directors of the big five around Australia to step up and follow IATSIS and embrace the idea of because they are original languages. They're, those languages belong to this country. Mm. Um, it doesn't, yeah, we, we're not really us without acknowledging that we have a black history and that includes a black linguistic history. So um, we just have to hold tight. And when you see someone slipping, pull it up, especially those in power. What's, what's the future shape of, of Australia as a country if, if, if those things are held to and if those things are honoured and respected? What does it become? Future, I, I will talk about, in, I think, as an Indigenous writer, and I'd like to hear from Beirut also, particularly about coming from that um, history of cruelty in Australia toward the other, um, toward initially indigenous people in the colonization of Australia um, and through the white, to the right, white Australia policy and right through to Tampa and, and Manus and the way that we treat um, the outsider. But in terms of an indigenous future, I mean, the Uluru statement from the heart is really important to a lot of communities and I think that needs to be embraced. I think we just need more representation. I think there's, we need to have a conversation about sovereign lands and also Indigenous management of lands because we're not a, our landscape in Australia is not the English countryside, it's not the Irish countryside. You cannot um, impose those ideas of land management on, on Australia. 
So we need to really have to have a future, especially considering the climate and and coming up to bush fire season. Look, looking at Fraser Island just now last week, I mean there needs to be constant consultation. Or looking at what Rio Tinto did in WA, like there needs to be constant respectful consultation, and all that comes from a, a, a nation that embraces its First Nations people, culture, land, languages, story, and respectfully, it comes through education. And I don't know, like, let's be hopeful, but it, it, we can't just have hope. It's not right? a zero sum game though, is it? There has to be, um, there has to be an agreement from colonial Australia, from settler Australia, that it needs to give back, that it needs to not just... A hundred percent. Yeah, but you can't have reconciliation Australia. You can't have this idea of reconciliation without reparation. You know, there's so many studies on it. So, um, th th and there needs to be constant truth-telling and constantly being engaged and entwined and not ha having those issues... Go to go fall on the back burner. Um, Beirut, what about you? What about a future for Australia in terms of what I are think, you saying before? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the general thing I understand through my experience um, is that I think the most powerful language to because we, we don't need really, you know, uh, making people, I mean, awareness is not enough, you know? I, I watch a, a Q&A, ABC, about the, uh, you know, indigenous uh, people in Australia. Everyone in the panel, the liberal uh, representative, the labor, the host, audience, the Aboriginal people there, everyone were nice towards the indigenous people. Everyone were, they say, we feel sorry. But in the end, the uh, Aboriginal uh, yeah, person in the panel, she said that we have a simple message uh demand don't kill us so and i uh, you know as a person who look at australia from outside i was asking this question from myself wow how that possible everyone are sorry everyone are supporting the indigenous people and she said don't kill us how that possible you know i think the, the important thing is just uh, so in Australia we have a systematic discrimination and violence. You know, I experienced that hugely, you know, deeply I experienced that. That how what is systematic torture means, you know. That even the refugees now in the detention in Australia, they have access to Twitter, you know but they cannot uh, really express themselves that uh, what is happening in the detention, how life is difficult. They cannot describe this violence, you know? They have access to Twitter, to Facebook, you know? They can write anything they want, but no, they, they are not able because this violence is, is something really that you cannot prove it easily, you know? And I think the most powerful language to challenge this system is art and literature, because you challenge the uh, knowledge. Uh, I mean, you create knowledge and you, through that you challenge the perspective. You know, to challenge the perspective, you challenge the, uh, imagination you know that's why I think the, that's why I really deeply I respect what uh, Tara is doing and exactly Tara is doing that you know I say that she 
put a mirror in front of Australia to see the dark part of Australia, the darkness of uh, this face, you know, the ugly side, you know, that is uh, exist. So Australia is not a country, just, uh, you know, that picture that Australia uh, introduced to the world, that is a beautiful white country with the beaches and people are just happy in the, beside the, that place, opera house or, you know, there is a big beach in Sydney, I don't know what it, yeah, you know, that is not Australia. That is Australia too, but that is only the official picture. Well, yeah. as, some, as, as someone says in the comments here, and, and it's, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the success that, that both of you has had as writers and the, re the receptivity of, of readers to those ideas. As someone says in the comments, someone who's calling themselves me in the comments, uh, says oh, yeah. it's another, another example of the disconnect between what I hope is a large proportion of the population and those with the political and economic power. And I think I think that's true. There's a conversation going on amongst ordinary people in this place, which is very different to the political conversation. Um, and and both of you, and I'm, I'm saying this in closing because our time is up. Both of you are are important parts of that conversation. So we we salute you for that. Um, look, thank you to Beirut Bachani and to Tara June Winch. It's been a, an interesting chat. More of their conversation in, in the current edition of Mianjin, which you can read. And I'll give the plug here for Mianjin. It's its 80th birthday. We're in a subscriber-thon at the moment. If you, if you subscribe to the magazine in the next day or two, you get the chance to win every day $2,000 worth of Australian books, all of which contain dangerous ideas. Uh, so read them at your peril. Um, it's um, great thanks to uh, Essential and the, and the Australia at Home people for, for staging this event. Um, and thanks to all of you who've gathered to have a look and a listen. We appreciate your attention and, and your, your good thoughts. Uh, Beirouz, Tara, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Happy birthday. Yay, me, Angie. Uh, um, lolly bags on the way out, everybody, and grab a <laughs> slice of cake in a paper bag. <laughs> That's what we want. <laughs> Bye, -bye. Bye, guys.